chapter 10, a new civilization emerges in Western Europe, and we'll be looking at stages of post-classical development, Western culture in the post-classical era, changing economic and social forms in the post-classical centuries, and the decline of the medieval synthesis. All right, the sixth to 10th, the sixth to 10th centuries, fragmentation is going to prevail. Most of Western Europe is uh, going to be fragmented. You're, this is going to be uh, Western Europe's feudal time period, so there's going to be a comparison in the fact that Western Europe goes backwards. Uh, controlled by the Roman Empire, a civilization that was um, extremely strong in their politics and their foundations of economics. Um, and uh, they're going to collapse, you're going to have barbarians come in, and they're actually going to revert backwards. And so the comparison is, is where China had their feudal period and moves forward. Uh, here in Western Europe, you have their emergence of uh, the Roman Empire in the Classical Age, and now all of a sudden we're reverting back even further than the Classical Age. And this is in the 6th and 10th century, so well uh, with a thousand years here. The Catholic Church is going to emerge as a strong point that's going to be a stability in this area, and you're going to have, um, not that they form a government in politics, but they will be a little bit of some political stability uh, during this time um, of their feudal era. The Iberian Peninsula is going to be controlled by the Arabs, and so we saw this in chapter 6 and 7 with the Umayyad dynasty as their rulers are being assassinated. Some of them flee up into the Iberian Peninsula, which is present day Spain and Portugal. Uh, the core of these areas will be the Low Countries, which is France, uh, well, actually, Netherlands, France, Germany, um, and then Italy. And later on, we'll see in this chapter, um, England will start to emerge as a little bit more of a power. The Scandinavian Vikings are going to cause a lot of this uh, disruption during this time period and add to that fragmentation with raids from the 8th to 10th centuries, and those are going to uh, be some big struggles. It won't be until they convert to Christianity where some of that starts to slow down. And then the literacy rate is going to be in a major decline in this era. Um, it basically, your church and your upper royals uh, will be the only ones educated uh, in literacy, and even then they're going to struggle with keeping the Latin alive. Um, and having uh, a full translation, even some of the monks will apologize for bad translations uh, of text. Uh, there's several maps on here to help you with locations. I'd make sure you understand them with Viking raids um, and their routes. It'll also explain some of the routes to Kiwi and Rus from the previous chapter, chapter 9, as well. Uh, the manual system, obligations and allegiances, your feudal time period, it's set up on manners. Basically, you have the king and the pope as your highest. You then have your nobles, which were lords, and you had your patriarchs, which are cardinals and bishops, on the next level. Uh, your third level will be vassals, or knights, and then your next level will be peasants, and then after that are serfs. The difference between peasants and serfs are peasants were free to come and go on the manor, uh, most of the time they're going to stay, and most of your peasants are serfs. But serfs were bound to the land. In order to have that land, they had to work on it, and so they were bound to it and couldn't leave, whereas a peasant, uh, the few that were free were allowed uh, to wander and move on uh, to where they wanted to. Your manners were mostly agricultural economy. Uh, this is kind of an understatement in the fact that the economy was the manor itself. Uh, it wasn't like an expanding economy. The agriculture that occurred is going to be enough to feed uh, the people on that manor at the Lord's house. And then the serfs are having, and the peasants that are on the land are having to farm another set of property for their own food to survive. And so it's a difficult life. Uh, this isn't a blossoming economy in any manner of the sort. You might have some few things from an orchard um, being sent to a king, uh, but for the most part, it's kind of a self-sufficient area. Uh, of its own. Uh, reciprocal obligations uh, and kind labor for produce, we have serfdom. The 800s, agriculture innovation, you'll get the mold board, which is basically an advanced toe that has a curved blade that can dig deeper into the ground and turn it up for tilling, which is going to be uh, a major advancement. And then you'll have crop rotation, which you have the three field system uh, versus what was the two field system where they farmed half the land and let the other half rest. Now they'll, field, uh, now they'll farm two-thirds of it, and you'll have a crop rotation based off of seasons uh, and what is growing in that season. Uh, again, an image to help you uh, with the hierarchy of the feudal system. 
the church and political and spiritual power, the popes will follow Roman organization. So there is some structure, uh, and it's going to be found more in the church than it is anywhere else. Um, the bishops were appointed by the pope, or in most cases where the Lord had enough power, the king had enough power, they would appoint the bishops. Um, the church will sponsor missionaries, as we talked about in chapter 9. There was a competition between the Catholics and the Orthodox Church for converting people in the Baltic Slavic Russian region. Uh, monasticism, Benedict of Nursia is going to come up with the, uh, the Benedictine rule, which was your uh, way of life on a monastery for the monks. It will serve a couple purposes, uh, spiritual functions and secular functions. The spiritual holiness network, pilgrimage, uh, secular education, which at this time is where most of your education is going to be found, which will eventually lead to the emergence of universities in the 13th century. Uh, large estates, so they will have farming to aid people in times of famine and droughts where they're struggling with their agriculture, and also shelter for travelers as well. Charlemagne and his successors, the Frankish Carolingian dynasty, is going to emerge under Charles Martel, who is nicknamed the Hammer. He's the one who's going to stop the Islamic expansion into Europe. We read about this in chapter 6, where they're advancing up beyond the Iberian Peninsula into France, and uh, Charles Martel is going to defeat somewhat of a depleted uh, Islamic army, but it is, a, it is an important defeat because it keeps um, the Islamic armies out of the rest of Europe. And that's going to happen in 732 at the Battle of Tours. Uh, after Charles Martelli of Charles the Great, uh, known as Charlemagne, who will be crowned the Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope in 800. And uh, he is going to copy the Roman central administration. So you're going to have a glimpse of some centralization that's going to occur, uh, but just a glimpse of it. Once Charlemagne dies in 814, the empire is split up and fragmented. Uh, finally, with the Treaty of Verdun in 843, you'll have three kingdoms between his three sons, and you'll end up with some pretty bad rulers after that. Uh, the Holy Roman Emperors will rule most of Germany and Italy, and we'll see them start to gain some more power uh, in the next couple chapters under the Habsburgs. Again, a couple maps splitting up the three areas. I would make sure you have an understanding of those locations. The new economic and urban vigor, agricultural improvement. So we already talked about the mold board and the, um, <clears throat> the uh, crop rotation. We're now seeing uh, a horse-drawn uh, plow, so the horse collar is coming in. It's going to allow them to farm more land and dig deeper into the ground. So areas in France and Germany that had difficult terrains are now being able to be expanded upon. Um, increase in production. So we've studied this since chapter one. More food, you can feed more mouths, so your population is going to increase. That's going to affect the growth of towns. With that, people looking to, uh, to, to come to more power. And so within that, literacy rates are going to expand because with education, they're able to control more things. Uh, education, as mentioned earlier, in the 13th century with universities is going to uh, come from the cathedral schools. So your monasteries and your churches we're holding debates under uh, theology and philosophy during the 11th century, and that's going to eventually expand into people wanting to pay for education and uh, learning. This is also going to be the same time period where the Crusades are bringing back uh, the Greek and Roman learning from the Crusades from what Islam had preserved. And so all of this accumulated together, education starting to reemerge in Western Europe, and you'll have your first universities in Italy, and then France, and then, of course, Oxford and Cambridge in England. Uh, a picture of the manor to help you understand it. Feudal monarchs and political advances. You're going to have some personal relationships here where um, basically you'll have some marriages that are going to gain land and gain power. Uh, military service for land. Uh, as more power is gained, especially among some of these kings, they're going to start to rely more on their own armies than calling upon the lords uh, to gather one large army. They'll already be developing them. And in return for the military service, these vassals and knights will receive uh, land. Some of the lords emerge more powerful, especially in France, and even some of them you'll start to develop a bureaucracy with some development in some states. Again, nothing compared to what we saw in Eastern Europe and nothing compared to what we saw in uh, China. It's still going to be a while until you have that. 
William the Conqueror in 1066 will have his conquest of England and he will start to form a centralized government. Uh, the beginning stages of it. You'll see sheriffs, courts, and eventually we'll see a parliament. Um, but again, it's still a much slower par process than what we saw in other areas that we've previously studied. Limited government, so you're still going to have political fragmentation that's going to continue on. Monarchs will be limited by the church, nobles, and towns. In 1215, we have the Magna Carta sign, which is going to limit the power of the king, King John, um, is basically forced into writing this and it's going to limit his power when dealing with taxes. Uh, representative bodies are going to emerge. Andrew and I are going to start to have parliaments. Uh, monarchies are going to continue to increase in power and we'll have some large conflicts between England and France who start to emerge as uh, the power in Western Europe and we'll have the Hundred Years War that takes a toll on those two countries. Uh, we have developments in England and France. Uh, I put up a chart here. Uh, again, look at the PowerPoint under Chapter Resources uh, if you need any further understanding. The West Expansionist Impulse. So um, we're starting to see their growth a little bit. They're starting to slowly emerge and they're going to be expanding. We've talked about the Crusades with Pope Urban II in 1095. Uh, there was initial success. Uh, and of course, we've read about in Chapter 7 and even in Chapter 9 with Saladin reconquering some of these lands uh, that uh, the Crusaders were able to hold for about a hundred years. Um, you'll also have northern expansion um, and you'll also have the uh, Crusades into the Reconquista which was the reconquering of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, Crusades cause and effects, we've talked about this numerously again if you're needing uh, more help and studies on that there's a chart in the PowerPoint for you. All right, religious reform and evolution, uh, Gregorian reform, so Gregory VII and St. Clair are going to add more of a separation between state and, um, and religion, a separation of secular and religious spheres, um, so starting to separate some of the philosophical beliefs of where they stand and what should be the church and what should be the state. Uh, we'll come into our high middle ages during this time period with theology and philosophy being heavily debated. So education kind of picking up. You'll have um, Bernard of Clairvaux uh, versus um, Abelard's approach, which was the rational examination of doctrine. So kind of debating some of the philosophies of God and who he is and, um, and also debating some of the ideas of creation as well. You'll even see to some point uh, some Islamic philosophers uh, and Christian philosophers agreeing on the point of God and creation um, and backing what the secular views were starting to have during this time period. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, faith was your primary uh, reason uh, and reason leads to understanding. So this is going to be a time period of scholasticism. This is going to start to challenge some of the basis of what was occurring and we're going to start to see the feudal period decline and eventually with its decline and some of the political struggles that we'll have we'll see in future chapters the emergence of um, the renaissance and reformation and then expansion and, explo and exploration. Uh, popular religion um, in other areas uh, you'll have the survival of pagan practices uh, religious themes in art and literature. Uh, you're going to see uh, the monasteries and you're going to see the Gothic architecture in the 11th century. By the 12th century vernacular, so your uh, secular literature, your uh, language of um, the natives in that region, uh, Dutch, uh, French, English start to emerge and separate themselves from Latin which was used in the church and even in some churches you're starting to have those uh, vernacular languages. Uh, Gothic architecture for you. Peasants versus landlords. Uh, peasants are slowly uh, gaining more power and more control. Uh, monarchs are starting to establish themselves a little bit more, so we're seeing the decline of um, the feudal period. Uh, we're also seeing the emergence of Italy during this time period with banking. Uh, money is going to replace the barter system and you're going to have banking and insurance emerge and uh, trade emerge in Italy. 
Uh, the Hanseatic League is going to try and compete with Italy, which is the northern German and southern Scandinavian uh, merchants, but ultimately Italy is going to emerge for a while as a power in the Mediterranean that competes with uh, the Islamic Arabs in that region. Uh, merchants are relatively free, but relatively low on the status, which we talked about earlier. Guilds will emerge to protect the markets of these areas and to um, help the craftsmen. Uh, limited sphere for women. Um, uh, even though equality was um, talked about within the church between men and women, you're still going to have this hierarchy of men above women, and um, they're not going to have um, that many rights as we saw them have in Eastern Europe. Uh, widespread warfare from 1300 to 1500 with the Hundred Years War is going to uh, weaken a lot of the feudal order. Uh, populations are going to be uh, hurt by outstripped agriculture, and then of course famines, and then the Black Death of the Bubonic Plague uh, from 1348 is going to kind of wreak havoc on population as well, which will affect the decline of the feudal period. Um, the increase in foot soldiers with the king's army and uh, the church becoming increasingly rigid, so a continuation of a further split between the church and state is going to um, kind of aid in that decline of the feudal period as well. I've put two charts in here to help you understand the Middle Ages, and I would look over those as well. And that will conclude chapter 10.